Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Tenement Museum's Book Talks here. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking with Richard Rothstein about his book, The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government uh, Segregated America. My name is Katie, um, and I will be moderating the talk this evening. Um, if you are new to the Tenement Museum or haven't visited before, we're a museum located in the neighborhood of the Lower East Side in New York City. We talk about immigrants, migrants, and refugees through the real stories of families who actually lived in our two buildings, 97 Orchard Street and 103 Orchard Street. And we are so honored tonight to be hosting Richard in this talk. Um, Richard is an, ex uh, is an American academic and he's affiliated with the Economic Policy Institute. Um, he's as a senior fellow and he's emeritus at the Thurgood Marshall Institute of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Um, his book, The Color of Law is available in our shop to purchase. Um, and many of the themes that he will be talking about tonight come into play on our tours and in our programming and affected, affects all of us and the residents of our two buildings um, in the Lower East Side and uh, plays out in the stories we tell often um, on our everyday tours. Um, I do want to let you know that throughout tonight's talk, you're welcome to add questions into the chat. Um, we will be taking questions in the last few minutes of the program. So you're welcome to contribute them throughout the program tonight. Um, and then they will be um, moderated at the end for you. Um, also, if you'd like to um, make a donation tonight, um, for the book talk, you can do so. Um, Arabella, who's moderating the talk on the YouTube end, will be dropping that um, donation link into the chat. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to um, Richard to talk about his wonderful book, The Color of Law. Thank you very, very much. Um, as you know, I'm a big fan of the Tenement Museum. I uh, brought my 10-year-old uh, grandson uh, there a few years ago, and we had a terrific visit. And um, I urge uh, all of you to do the same if you can. Um, but that's not what I'm here to talk about uh, this evening. Um, I want to begin by reminding all of us <clears throat> that in the 20th century, we had a civil rights movement in this country. Uh, it began by challenging segregation in colleges and universities, and uh, then in 1954, as you know, won a Supreme Court decision that uh, prohibited racial segregation in um, legal segregation in elementary and secondary schools. And then that Brown decision gave impetus, a stimulation, a inspiration to a, a movement of activists, a civil rights movement. They engaged in marches, demonstrations, civil disobedience, uh, people lost their lives in that uh, struggle, uh, but um, at, by the end of the 1960s, the civil rights movement had pretty much convinced the country, uh, not everybody, but that pretty much, that racial segregation was wrong, it was immoral, it was harmful both to African Americans and to whites, it was incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy. Uh, we had, by the end of the 1960s, uh, abolished segregation in uh, lunch counters, uh, buses, uh, as well as schools and colleges, uh, public accommodations, interstate, interstate transportation, employment. Uh, in 1968, uh, we succeeded in getting a Fair Housing Act passed that prohibited uh, future discrimination in elementary and second, I'm sorry, <laughs> future discrimination in housing, the sale and rental of housing. And, um, but then the civil rights movement ended. It left untouched the biggest segregation of all, which is that every metropolitan area in this country is residentially segregated. Uh, I've lived in many of them, uh, many of them that I've lived in, all of them I've lived in actually were uh, residentially segregated by race, uh, clearly defined neighborhoods that were all white or mostly white, clearly defined areas that were all black or mostly black. How could it be? If we understood that racial segregation was wrong, immoral, harmful to both blacks and whites, incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy, uh, how can it be that we left untouched the biggest segregation of all? Partly, I guess, it's because it's hard to figure out how to redress segregation. <clears throat> if we pass a law prohibiting segregation of restaurants, the next day you could go to any restaurant, 
sit anywhere in the restaurant that you wanted. But if we pass a law prohibiting segregation of neighborhoods, the next day things wouldn't look much different. So what we've done, all of us, and I mean all of us, uh, blacks, whites, liberals, conservatives, northerners, southerners, we've adopted the national rationalization, a myth we tell ourselves, an excuse we give ourselves for not dealing with the um, serious segregation of this country by neighborhood, uh, by race. The rationalization goes something like this. We tell ourselves that uh, the kinds of segregation that we abolished in the 20th century uh, was done by government. If the federal government was doing it, it was a violation of the Fifth Amendment, a constitutional violation, a civil rights violation. And we know that if we have a civil rights violation, we have an obligation as American citizens to do something about it. Uh, if the state and local governments were doing it, that was a violation of the 14th Amendment, also a civil rights violation, a constitutional violation, that we also have an obligation to do something about as American citizens. But residential segregation, we tell ourselves, that's something entirely different. Different. Uh, that wasn't done by government, not by law, by regulation, by public policy of any kind. That just sort of happened naturally. Uh, it's happened by accident. It happened because, oh, uh, bigoted private uh, homeowners or landlords refused to sell or rent homes to African-Americans in white neighborhoods. Or maybe actors, businesses in the private economy, not government agencies, but uh, private companies like banks and insurance companies and real estate agents uh, discriminated in how they uh, carried out uh, their private sector activities, not government activities. Or maybe we tell ourselves it's just because blacks and whites like to live with each other of the same race. We feel more comfortable that way. We'd rather be with people who have the same skin, skin color as, as ourselves. Or maybe we tell ourselves it's all the result of income differences. African Americans, on average, have uh, lower incomes, family incomes than whites. And so many can't afford to uh, move to uh, middle class white neighborhoods. All of these individual, personal, private sector, bigoted activities is what created residential segregation. And we tell ourselves what happened by accident can only unhappen by accident. We may think it's too bad. We don't like living in an apartheid system. But uh, since government didn't do it, it just happened accidentally, it has to unhappen accidentally. Well, uh, I spent uh, many years uh, writing about education policy. I didn't come to the topic of this book until about 10 years ago, a little bit more than that. Um, and as an education policy writer in the 1990s and 2000s, I spent uh, most of my time criticizing the dominant educational theory of the country at the time. Uh, that theory was the big, if not the biggest problem that schools faced was an achievement gap between African-American and white children. African-American children achieve at lower levels uh, on average than white children, not all, but on average. And we told ourselves that the reason that there's this achievement gap is that uh, teachers have low expectations of black children. Uh, they're, they're bigoted. They just don't try very hard when they uh, see black children. And if only we could make teachers try harder, the achievement gap would disappear. That was the theory. We enacted it into law. Uh, it was called the No Child Left Behind Law, passed in 2001. The law provided that uh, we would test children every year and hold teachers accountable for their test scores. And if we did that, the achievement gap would disappear. That's what the law predicted. Well, I thought it was a ludicrous theory. Uh, uh, of course, there are some bigoted teachers who have low expectations of black children, but that's not the reason we have an achievement gap. The main reason we have an achievement gap is because so many uh, black children coming from low-income neighborhoods uh, come with social and economic disadvantages that impede their ability to take advantage of what schools have to offer. So I remember I wrote one column about uh, uh, asthma. Uh, as you may know, uh, in urban areas, low-income uh, uh, African-American neighborhoods, children have asthma at four times the rate of middle-class children. It's an enormous difference, four times the rate. They have asthma at four times the rate because they live in more polluted neighborhoods, uh, more diesel trucks driving through their neighborhoods, uh, uh, more vermin in the environment, more dilapidated buildings, uh, more uh, empty lots kicking up dust. Uh, 
And if a child has asthma, that child uh, is more likely than a child who doesn't have asthma to um, be up at night wheezing and then come to school drowsing the next day. And um, if you have two groups of children who are identical in every respect, except that uh, one group has a higher rate of asthma than the other, that group's going to have lower average achievement, not by a lot, by a little bit on average. But then when you think about all the other conditions that have a similar impact on a student's ability to learn, uh, asthma, lead poisoning, lead poisoning has a measurable impact on uh, cognitive ability, on IQ, and uh, it's much more prevalent in low-income uh, neighborhoods uh, where buildings aren't uh, kept up to standard, where pipes are old and, and uh, filled with lead. Um, homelessness, economic insecurity, each of these makes a small difference in the achievement of children. But when you add them all up, it uh, pretty much explains the achievement gap. Uh, and then I realized that it's one thing if a child has asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness or economic insecurity. But what happens if you have a school where every child has either asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness or economic insecurity or any of many other social and economic challenges? How can such a school where those children are concentrated ever be able to have achievement that's comparable to what you get where, in a school where children come well-rested, well-nourished, uh, in sec economically secure homes. You can't possibly expect that. Well, we call those schools where we concentrate children with those kinds of social and economic disadvantages, we call them segregated schools. Mm -hmm. And schools are more segregated today than they ever have been in the last 45 years. And the reason they're more segregated is because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. So I began to think that maybe neighborhood segregation was a school problem, an educational problem. That's how I came to the, the, this topic of the, that I'm talking about tonight. I wasn't really thinking about housing policy. To me, it was an educational problem. But then in 2007, I read a Supreme Court decision. Uh, it involved two school districts, uh, Seattle, Washington, and Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, both of these districts had a very, very token uh, school desegregation plan attempting to um, address the kinds of issues that uh, I've been describing. In both districts, they gave parents the choice of which school their child would attend. But if the choice was going to further exacerbate segregation, that choice wouldn't be honored in favor of the choice of a child who wouldn't do so. So if you had a, an all white or mostly white school and there was one place left in that uh, school, and uh, both a black and a white child applied for it. The black child would be given some preference. Very token plan. Uh, you don't have one place left in the school very often, and both a black and a white child apply for it. But the Supreme Court denounced this program, said you couldn't do such a thing. The uh, controlling opinion was written by Chief Justice John Roberts. Uh, the Chief Justice explained that the, the reason the schools in Louisville and Seattle are segregated uh, is because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. He was right about that. And then he went on to say that the neighborhoods in Louisville and uh, Seattle are segregated de facto, was the term he used, because of private bigotry, actions of private businesses, people wanting to live with each other, the same race, income differences, all the things I described before. And he said, we have de facto segregation, something that government did not create. Government is prohibited from doing anything to fix it. Well, I read this decision and um, I remembered reading about something some years before uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, there in a uh, all white suburb outside the center city of Louisville called Shively, there was a white homeowner, single family homes, all white suburb, who had an African-American friend living in downtown Louisville. The African-American friend had a friend, the, was, the friend was a, a decorated Navy veteran. He had a wife and a child, a good job. He wanted to buy a single family home, but nobody would sell him one. So the white homeowner in this suburb of Shively bought a second home and resold it to his African-American friend. And when the African-American family moved in, an angry mob surrounded the home, protected by the police. Uh, they threw rocks through the windows. Police made no effort to stop them. They dynamited and firebombed the home. The police made no effort to stop them. But when this riot was all over, 
the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year jail sentence, the white homeowner for sedition. I said to myself, this doesn't sound to me much like de facto segregation. If the police, the criminal justice system, the courts, the prosecutors are all mobilized to enforce the racial boundaries of, of Louisville, Kentucky. And I began to look into it further, and I'm not exaggerating here. There were hundreds and hundreds of cases <clears throat> of police protected, sometimes even police organized and led mob violence that drove African-Americans out of homes that they had legitimately purchased or rented in um, predominantly white neighborhoods, all white neighborhoods. <clears throat> every one of these, every one of these riots, police protected or police led and organized, uh, was a civil rights violation, a violation of the 14th Amendment that uh, we've never attempted to redress. Uh, these kinds of incidents, uh, I say there were hundreds and hundreds of them, uh, was not just in border states like Louisville, they were in New York, uh, they were in Detroit and Chicago and Kansas City and Los Angeles and San Francisco, all over the country. Mob violence was driving African Americans out of homes that they had legitimately purchased or rented in the mid 20th century. Well, I began to look into it further, and I found that uh, it wasn't just police protected violence uh, that was um, maintaining segregation, enforcing and sustaining it in cities all across the country, but there were many, many federal, state, and local policies that were explicitly designed on a racial basis to ensure that African Americans and whites could not live near one another in any metropolitan area of this country. Uh, I don't have time this evening to describe many of them. Uh, I, I go through many, many of them in my book, but I'll just focus on a couple of the uh, most powerful of these policies. Uh, one was the policy of the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration in the uh, post-World War II period to move the entire white working class population out of urban areas into single family homes in all white suburbs like that one in, uh, outside Louisville, Shively that I described before. It was an explicitly racial policy. Uh, at the time, in the mid early 20th century, there were many, many integrated neighborhoods, many more than we have today in downtown areas uh, for the simple reason <clears throat> that we were a manufacturing economy at that time, uh, no internet, uh, just making things, and factories had to be located near deep water ports or railroad terminals uh, so that uh, uh, they could get their parts and ship their final products. Uh, factory workers had to live close enough to be able to walk to work or maybe take short streetcar or in New York subway rides uh, to get to work. Um, so they were living in broadly the same neighborhoods. Uh, the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration came up with a program uh, to move those workers, whites only, out of those urban areas into single family homes in all white suburbs. Um, you know these suburbs because they exist everywhere. I assume many of you uh, uh, participating uh, this evening in this webinar are from New York. So you know Levittown, east of New York City, but they exist in every metropolitan area of this country. We weren't a suburban country at the time. The Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration, as I said, um, we're creating the suburbanization for the first time on a mass basis. Uh, to take Levittown, for example, that was 17,000 homes in one place. William Levitt, the builder, could never have assembled the capital to buy the land and build those homes uh, uh, by himself. No bank would be crazy enough to lend him the money to uh, buy the land and build those homes. Uh, banks thought that the building a suburb like this was a crazy idea. Nobody would want to move to a place like that. We weren't, as I say, a suburban country. The only people living in suburbs were affluent people. The only way that Levitt uh, could uh, build this development for returning war veterans in the late 1940s, the only way he could do it was by going to, going to the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration, submitting his plans for the development the uh, materials he was going to use, the architectural design, the uh, uh, layout of the streets, and a commitment required by the Federal Housing and Veterans Administration that, would, that he would never sell a home to an African-American. The FHA and VA even required that he place a clause in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African-Americans or rental to African-Americans. <clears throat> 
Those clauses, by the way, in the deeds are still there today. They're not enforceable any longer, but once something's in the deed, you can't change it. And they're in many, many uh, suburbs around New York City and around every metropolitan area of this country. This was not this requirement uh, to create segregated all white suburbs was not the action of rogue bureaucrats at the Federal Housing Administration, the Veterans Administration. It was written federal policy. The Federal Housing Administration distributed a manual to uh, appraisers all over the country whose job it was to um, uh, evaluate the applications of developers, of builders, to create uh, suburban subdivisions. Uh, and then to recommend or not recommend that they get federal guarantees for their bank loans. The manual said explicitly that you couldn't recommend for a federal bank guarantee a development that was um, going to sell to African-Americans. The manual went so far as to say that you couldn't even recommend for a federal bank guarantee a proposal from a builder or a developer that was for an all-white development that would be located near where African-Americans were living because in the words of the manual, and I'm quoting, that would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. That's what the federal policy manual said. This notion of de facto segregation is other nonsense. There's no basis in reality to it whatsoever, even though we all believe it, we all use the term. The segregation of this country, the creation of this white noose around every metropolitan area was the explicit racial design of the federal government, unconstitutional, violation of the Fifth Amendment, a blatant constitutional violation, that we've never assumed the responsibility, as we should as American citizens, to remedy. Well, those homes in Levittown and all the similar suburbs everywhere in the country, uh, created for whites only, uh, were inexpensive. They were returning war veterans. Uh, maybe some of you actually live, live there or know people who do. They sold in the late 1940s uh, when they were first built for about you know, $8,000. In today's money, that's about $100,000. Uh, as you all know, homes in Levittown no longer sell for $100,000. Uh, they sell for $300,000, $400,000, uh, maybe more in some parts of the country. Uh, and all of these developments uh, were similarly priced at that time. In some parts of the country, these $100,000 homes now sell for a million dollars or more. The white families who moved into those homes, who bought those homes, uh, uh, most of them returning war veterans, but not all, uh, for $100,000 gained over the next couple of generations wealth from the appreciation and the value of the homes, from the equity they, get, they had in their homes. Uh, most families in this country who have wealth have it from the equity they have in their, in their homes. Uh, the white families who gained this wealth uh, used it to send their children to college. They used it uh, perhaps to take care of uh, medical emergencies or maybe temporary unemployment. If you have wealth, you can weather temporary unemployment. If you don't have wealth and you lose a job, you're permanently pushed further down the social and economic scale, uh, perhaps for generations. Uh, the um, white families used that wealth to um, uh, subsidize their retirements, and they used it to bequeath wealth to their children and grandchildren, who then had down payments for their own homes. African Americans were prohibited, prohibited by explicit federal racial policy from participating in this wealth generating program. Uh, the result is that today, African American incomes on average are about 60% of white incomes, family incomes, 60%. There's a big gap there. There's a story behind that as well. I don't have time to go into that this evening. Uh, but you would think that if there was a 60% income ratio between black family wealth and uh, income and white family income, that there would be a similar ratio for wealth. People can save the same amount of money from uh, the same incomes. But the fact is that while African-American family incomes are 60% of white family incomes, African-American household wealth is about 5% of white household wealth. And that enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 5% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy.
that was practiced in the mid 20th century and that has never been remedied and that we've never accepted the responsibility to remedy. And that wealth gap uh, determines much of the racial inequality and many of the social problems that we have in this country today. Uh, this unconstitutional wealth gap. I described before how the concentration of families in low-income neighborhoods uh, from which they have uh, no ability to, to escape because for, for many reasons, but among them is they have no down payments for homes outside these low-income neighborhoods. Um, <clears throat> it predicts the achievement gap in schools for reasons I described earlier. It predicts um, health disparities between African-Americans and whites. African-Americans, as you may know, have shorter life expectancies, greater rates of cardiovascular disease uh, because they live in more polluted neighborhoods, uh, more dangerous neighborhoods. It predicts the mass incarceration and police abuse of African-Americans that we spent so much time focused on in the last few months. Uh, I'm not suggesting that uh, no police officers would ever abuse any African-American young men if it weren't for segregation, but segregation can, creates the conditions for a much, much more expansive uh, police abuse of, of young African-American men when you concentrate the most disadvantaged young men without good jobs, access to good jobs or the transportation even to get to them uh, in single neighborhoods. It's inevitable the police are going to get involved in confrontations with them, that the police will adopt the stance of an occupying force, much as police forces that occupied uh, colonial countries, uh, Congo, India, uh, behave. This, this is the way our police forces behave to control a low-income segregated community. Uh, as I say, some uh, abuse would certainly still exist. I don't think uh, many, but some police officers would still continue to abuse African-Americans if they were not segregated, but the segregation uh, makes it much more intense. And the segregation that we've created, our government on our behalf, has created also um, is responsible for something else that we're particularly obsessed with uh, this week and next, and that's the, um, the, the unprecedented extreme political polarization that we have in this country today that largely tracks racial lines. It's not entirely racial, but it largely tracks racial lines. How can we ever expect to create, uh, to preserve, to sustain, uh, the common national identity that we need for this democracy. If so many African-Americans and whites live so far from each other that we have no ability to understand each other, to empathize with each other, to envision each other's life experiences. That's one of the, those are the consequences of the segregation that we created. Well, let me describe one other policy that the federal government followed. As I said, there are many, many others that uh, I describe in The Color of Law. I was stunned as I wrote the book, as I discovered one policy after another that reinforced uh, all of them uh, to create the segregation. I'll describe one other. Uh, that's public housing. Uh, we all think we know what public housing is. We think it's a place where poor people live uh, in many parts of the country, dilapidated buildings, dysfunctional places. Uh, that's not how public housing began in this country. Public housing began in this country uh, during the New Deal in the Depression, in the Roosevelt administration. It was not for poor people. We had a 25% uh, unemployment rate uh, in that period, but um, public housing was not for the 25% who were unemployed. It was for the 75% who had good stable jobs, uh, had incomes that could pay the full cost of the housing and the rent. The government wasn't subsidizing the public housing. It was just building it because the private sector wasn't in the depression and renting it at market rates to uh, working class, lower middle class families. Everywhere the federal government built public housing, uh, it began in 1933, everywhere it built it, it segregated it, creating separate projects for whites, separate projects for African-Americans, uh, most for whites, uh, frequently creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. Uh, uh, I, I sure, I'm sure many of you, I hope many of you uh, know the work or familiar with uh, the great African-American poet, novelist, uh, Langston Hughes. He described in his autobiography how he grew up in an integrated downtown Cleveland neighborhood. As I explained before, that wasn't so unusual in those days. He said his best friend in high school was Polish, said he dated a Jewish girl in high school. 
uh, what you would expect to be happening in a integrated high school, an integrated neighborhood. Uh, the Public Works Administration went into that neighborhood of Cleveland, of downtown Cleveland, and demolished housing and created two separate projects, one for whites, one for African-Americans, creating segregation, a pattern of segregation in Cleveland with that and other projects elsewhere that were also segregated that persists to this day. Uh, in, in my book, The Color of Law, I like to uh, describe uh, self-satisfied smug places that uh, think they're better than everybody else. Uh, one you may have heard of, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, the area between Harvard and MIT, uh, the Central Square neighborhood was a fully integrated neighborhood in the 1930s. It was about half black and half white. Public Works Administration went into that neighborhood, demolished housing and built separate projects, one for whites, one for African-Americans, creating a pattern of segregation in the Boston metropolitan area with that and other projects that were also segregated uh, that persist to this day. This project of the federal government, uh, using housing policy to uh, create segregation, intensified during World War II, when uh, hundreds of thousands of workers flocked to centers of war production to take jobs in war plants that hadn't existed prior to the war, uh, during the Depression. Uh, these war workers who came to, to get jobs in the war industries uh, overwhelmed the communities that they migrated to. Um, these communities couldn't absorb them. There was no housing available for them. Uh, if the federal government wanted the ships and the airplanes and the tanks and the jeeps to be produced, it had to somehow find housing for these workers, and it did. It built public housing for war workers only, a segregated basis, separate projects for whites, separate projects for African Americans, frequently uh, for um, uh, workers who were working together in the same war plants but had to live separately by government policy. Uh, in many cases, this policy of the federal government uh, uh, during World War II created segregation where it hadn't previously been known uh, because these war plants were sometimes located in places where there were very few African-Americans prior to World War II. The entire West Coast is a good example of that. There were very few African-Americans living on the West Coast prior to World War II. Uh, they flocked uh, to um, the West Coast along with white workers from uh, Texas and Louisiana and Arkansas, uh, and um, they needed housing. The federal government, if it wanted the ships, it was mostly shipbuilding going on there and air, airplane manufacturing. If they wanted them to be produced, it had to find housing for these workers, and it did. In San Francisco, for example, the government built five uh, housing projects for war workers. Four were for whites only. One was for African-Americans, and that was placed in an area that later became the black neighborhood of San Francisco. Uh, the same policy was followed in Portland and Seattle and uh, Los Angeles, uh, creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. Well, uh, the policies to redress segregation are well known. There's no mystery about them. Uh, we know what to do. Uh, policy writers, journalists, think tanks have lots of ideas about how to redress segregation. The problem is not policy ideas. The problem is that we need a new civil rights movement that's going to make it uncomfortable for this country to maintain the segregated patterns that we've created. Uh, unless without that civil rights movement, all these great policy ideas have no chance of being implemented, constitutionally required though they may be. I'll mention a few of them, uh, but uh, I don't want to emphasize them because our need is not new ideas, our need is a new civil rights movement. Uh, but for example, uh, consider the, the problem of Levittown that I described before. Uh, as a result of the Fair Housing Act, 2% uh, of uh, Levittown is now African-American. Uh, these are African-Americans who were wealthy enough to be able to buy homes that cost three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000, who had down payments for them. But Levittown is located in a broader neighborhood that's, you know, I don't know, 15% African-American. So the difference between that 15% and the 2% that 13% difference is what the Fair Housing Act is incapable of addressing. We need an affirmative action program on housing to address it. The federal government should be buying up homes in Levittown at market rates and reselling selling them at deeply discounted prices to qualified African-Americans who are otherwise unable to afford to live there now, but whose families could have afforded to buy into Levittown 
um, when it was created. In fact, in my book, uh, The Color of Law, I describe a family of African-Americans who had a trucking company. They were a business people. They had a trucking company. They were hired by Levitt to uh, deliver sheetrock uh, to be used in the construction of Levittown, home, Levittown homes uh, during its construction in the late 1940s, but they were prohibited from living there. Uh, that would be an affirmative action program in housing. They would be perfectly justifiable, the, the subsidization by the federal government uh, of African-Americans to uh, buy homes in Levittown, perfectly justifiable on a constitutional basis once we recognize the history that I've described. And let me say that uh, uh, this book has been out uh, uh, for over three years, almost three and a half years now, and not a single fact that I've described to you this evening has uh, been challenged by a, a single uh, professional historian. So there's no question about the history that I've described. We've forgotten it as a people, but uh, it, it's unquestioned and it raises the basis for a constitutional program of redress. We have programs at the uh, lower income end of the lower, uh, lower income scale. Uh, that subsidize housing for low-income families, disproportionately uh, Black and Hispanic, uh, that also reinforce segregation today and that need to be modified as part of a program. The biggest one is the low-income housing tax credit that uh, creates a, a, a subsidy for developers to uh, build housing for low-income families, uh, subsidized housing. Um, that credit reinforces segregation because almost all of those programs by federal requirement, federal priority, are placed in existing low-income segregated neighborhoods, reinforcing their segregation. That would be an easy policy to change, but there's no political will uh, to do it. I'm working with a group of national civil rights leaders uh, to create a new national committee to redress uh, racial segregation. Uh, its focus will not be on um, advocating policy ideas. As I said, we know what they are. Its focus will be in creating local civil rights groups in communities everywhere in the country that will begin to uh, make noise, take action, uh, to make it uncomfortable to maintain the segregated patterns that uh, we have created. Uh, if um, any of you, we, we're about to launch um, uh, this national committee. Uh, uh, we were about to launch it before the uh, social distancing of the pandemic started and we're, we put it on hold, but we're now going to launch it soon again. And then if any of you on this uh, webinar um, want to uh, be informed beyond the uh, mailing list to get an announcement of the launch of this committee, uh, perhaps uh, you can let the, the Tenement Museum know and they can send me a list of webinar participants who want to, um, to do that. Um, with that, I, I think I'll uh, stop. It's uh, just about my time is up. I could talk about this for hours, but I'd uh, much prefer to engage in a conversation with you and, and take uh, any questions uh, about the history that I've described that, that may occur to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. And we have had a couple of questions come in um, through the chat. So the first one we have is, if public housing was for all people, all bites segregated, why did black people not succeed? Was it the movement to white, of whites to the suburbs to buy homes? Uh, well, as I, I described, um, African-Americans were um, restricted to living in um, urban areas, in um, uh, in public housing and in private uh, uh, housing in those areas while whites were subsidized to leave to um, all white suburbs at about the same time that this happened, at about the same time that the, the federal government was subsidizing whites to move. After all, I said before that whites were living along with African-Americans in urban areas because they needed to walk to work um, or take short st streetcar rides to get there. Uh, the reason that the federal government was able to subsidize uh, Af uh, white families uh, to move out of those areas into uh, single family homes in all white suburbs is because highways were being built. And those workers could not only get to work, but the highways permitted the factories to disappear. Uh, they moved to rural areas, uh, to suburban areas. They could get their parts and ship their final products by truck. Uh, 
So there were fewer and fewer good jobs left in the urban areas, which were now predominantly black because the whites had been moved out with federal subsidies, fewer and fewer good jobs. And uh, African-Americans in general became poorer and poorer without access to those good jobs. Soon, public housing had to be subsidized. It hadn't been subsidized initially, as I said, but when um, good jobs disappeared, black families could no longer afford uh, to pay the rent in these projects. They had to be subsidized. Once they were subsidized, uh, they deteriorated, they weren't maintained. And the, um, uh, we got the kind of urban slums that uh, we associate uh, mostly with public housing uh, today. Uh, so, um, I, I hope that explains it a little bit more. Uh, thank you. And I just wanted to add, because I saw some notes in the YouTube. Um, I know Arabella is putting it into the YouTube chat, but if you would like to reach out to the Tenement Museum so that we can be in contact with Richard about knowing more, you can email lestm at tenement.org. And I believe Arabella is going to drop it into the YouTube chat, that email. So if you email there, um, we will get those emails to Richard. Um, and then we have a second question that's come in, which is, what are the missing pieces that make this current moment not the beginning of a new civil rights movement? Well, I'm actually quite hopeful uh, about the future in this regard. We're having a more accurate and passionate discussion about the history, uh, the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow in this country than we ever have had before in American history. Uh, the recent uh, Black Lives Matter demonstrations, 25 million Americans participated in them. Uh, almost all of them nonviolent, peaceful demonstrations uh, demanding uh, reform of police practices, community policing, the demilitarization of the police. Uh, of that 25 million, most were whites. This is unprecedented in the history of this country, um, uh, civil rights movements that were overwhelmingly white. Now, um, of course, we need a civil rights movement that will emerge from that, those demonstrations. African-American led, uh, uh, whites can't be um, leading a civil rights movement. They can't be telling um, African-Americans how to live, but um, out of those demonstrations, a civil rights movement can emerge. Um, and with this uh, passionate discussion that we're having, I, I say it's unprecedented in American history. Uh, uh, it's not only my book it's, it, wh whose uh, reception has been stunning, uh, completely unexpected, but uh, there are many books. If you look at the bestseller lists, uh, every nonfiction book, well, not every, that's an exaggeration. Most nonfiction books on the bestseller lists are about one aspect or another of our racial history and about race. We have um, white elected Southern politicians running around the South, uh, removing statues that commemorate the, the defenders of slavery. That was inconceivable just a few years ago. Um, it's books like Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, uh, uh, Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy, the work of ta -Nehisi Coates. Like I say it's a more accurate and passionate discussion than we've ever had before. Out of that, I'm hopeful that the civil rights movement of activists can emerge. I'm not confident, but I'm hopeful. We certainly have the preconditions for it. Uh, and um, hopefully uh, uh, it will move in that direction. Um, you're, we're generating a lot of questions right now. So, um, and a good follow up to that one is we have a two part question here, which is what sort of reparation policy would reduce the wealth gap? And what is the best way to reduce the wealth gap between races? Well, one of them I described earlier, and that would be an affirmative action program in housing that would subsidize African-Americans to move into homes that would then be of great value. Uh, and uh, they would gain wealth from that uh, process that way they were denied as a result of the unconstitutional policies that we face. I wouldn't suggest uh, for a minute that all the things we need to do are race-based. Uh, uh, a more equitable income distribution would do a great deal to uh, help to narrow the wealth gap. If um, the occupations uh, in which African-Americans predominate, service occupations, for example, uh, uh, had higher wages, if we uh, re-energized and, and reauthorized the organization of unions, if we improved the minimum wage, uh, 
uh, far beyond the $15 that we're talking about now so that people could earn a living wage uh, in the jobs that they hold. Uh, uh, African-Americans in particular who disproportionately hold those kinds of jobs would be able to save and build wealth in that way. <clears throat> Home ownership, uh, the first pro program I mentioned is one way, but it's not a magic bullet. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's not a magic bullet. Um, you know, the whites who moved into Levittown and all of these suburbs around the country, they didn't know they were moving into a wealth generating machine. They had no idea that those homes were going to um, appreciate and value the way they did. Uh, the government's policy was not to create a wealth gap, it was to create segregation. Um, if you move into a, if you buy a home in a in a neighborhood that's not appreciating the way those white suburbs did, you're not going to gain wealth. And um, unfortunately, uh, much African American home ownership has been in neighborhoods because they're segregated uh, that haven't appreciated in value uh, the way that the white suburban neighborhoods have. So the African Americans, even if they've owned homes, have not gained uh, this uh, kind of magical wealth that whites have gained. So um, uh, I think income policies are, are a, a, a good place to focus. Home ownership, if you're smart enough to buy a home in a neighborhood that hasn't yet appreciated, but that will do so, uh, is another way. But uh, I'd, I'd uh, prefer to focus on income policies, which are more uh, secure as a way of uh, improving the financial security, which is another way of talking about wealth of African-American families. Uh, speaking of home ownership, we have um, a question about, was the quality of housing provided the same for whites and African-Americans in these segregated housing projects? Uh, typically not, but uh, uh, I don't think it was a, a big difference. Um, the, the problem was that once uh, the residents of these housing projects no longer had access to good jobs, uh, the, their incomes deteriorated, and then the government stopped them maintaining them. So when they became black, they also became they also deteriorated. But um, I don't think that the um, the major cause of that is a, a difference in uh, maintenance. There was some, there was some. There's no doubt about it. But that wasn't the major cause. The major cause was the uh, jobs disappearing from the communities where the public housing projects were located at the same time that those projects became predominantly black. Um, we also have a question, and I know that, um, Richard, you talk a great deal about this actually in the book. Um, so I like the phrasing of this question, which is, can you talk a little bit about white flight and its effects on the suburbs? Sure. Um, white flight, you know, during the, during the 20th century, I, I mentioned before, at the very beginning of the talk uh, this evening, that uh, there were um, many, many cases of African Americans being driven out of um, uh, homes that they had legitimately purchased or rented in white neighborhoods, typically neighborhoods that were close to the urban African American neighborhoods, inner ring suburbs, we call them, um, close to African American neighborhoods where they had lived. Um, that should um, suggest to you when you hear those stories that um, uh, obviously uh, African-Americans were able to buy into those neighborhoods. Well, how could that have been? How could that have been? Well, um, if you had a white homeowner who wanted to move for whatever reason, uh, maybe get a better uh, move to maybe get a job in a different city or need a bigger home for a larger family, whatever the reason may be. It was in a white homeowner's interest, even if he was prohibited from doing so by a racial deed, it would be in his interest to sell to an African-American rather than a white, because African-Americans were so overcrowded in the um, uh, urban neighborhoods where they had few so few opportunities to leave that their demand relative to supply was much greater than whites. So African-Americans were willing to pay more for similar housing the whites were willing to pay. So that's how the, the um, black uh, community expanded out of its original um, ghetto uh, confines. Well, what typically happened when uh, African-Americans moved uh, to uh, these white neighborhoods, they paid more for um, 
uh, the homes and the white would pay. Uh, if you went into these neighborhoods at that time, you would find that the best maintained homes were typically those of African-Americans. But what frequently happened is that uh, even though uh, the movement of African-Americans into these neighborhoods caused property values to rise because African-Americans were willing to pay more than whites, speculators and real estate agents uh, went into these neighborhoods to create panic and persuade uh, whites that their neighborhoods were soon going to become slums because African-Americans were going to move in and their properties would uh, decline in value and uh, they better move quickly. So uh, in my book, for example, I describe an interview that uh, one of these uh, speculators uh, gave to a national magazine in which he boasted about how he organized burglaries in white neighborhoods that a few African-Americans had moved into, maybe just the first African-American family, to try to persuade uh, uh, white families that uh, their neighborhood was soon going to deteriorate. Uh, he hired uh, African-American women to push baby carriages through the neighborhood to try to give the impression of rapid racial change. Uh, he um, uh, hired a uh, young black men to drive through the neighborhood with radios blasting. Uh, all of these tactics designed to uh, scare uh, whites that uh, even though their property values were temporarily rising, they would soon reverse and fall. Well, the whites um, who were persuaded, panicked in this way, uh, sold their homes at uh, below market rates to these speculators. Uh, who then uh, uh, turned around and resold them to qualified uh, 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 African-Americans at much higher prices than the market required. This whole process was called blockbusting. It was the major cause of white flight um, uh, in the mid 20th century. And um, it was all based on a, uh, a uh, panic that African-Americans would uh, cause the neighborhood to deteriorate when in fact, uh, the opposite was happening. And the scandal about this is that public authorities did nothing to stop this kind of uh, panic selling and manipulation by real estate agents. Uh, state licensing agencies uh, refused to, to discipline in any way uh, the real estate agents who were um, engaging in these kinds of practices. In fact, on the contrary, there were cases where uh, real estate agents' licenses were lifted because they sold a home to an African-American in a white uh, uh, neighborhood uh, initially. Um, I wanna, we only have a few more minutes left together and I'm gonna try to get as many of these questions in as possible. Um, we do have a timely one here, which is what do you think of the confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett and the now conservative leading Supreme Court? What does this mean for fixing the issues described? I don't think it means much. Uh, because uh, what's needed to fix these issues is a civil rights movement, an organized citizenry. The Supreme Court um, uh, pretends to be, as, as we all know, it pretends to be a neutral arbiter, but in fact, it, it sways uh, based on uh, public pressure. I know it's hard to imagine this Supreme Court switching, but it was just as hard to imagine, for example, the Supreme Court in the 1930s, uh, all of a sudden, uh, uh, having prohibited uh, many of the um, New Deal economic programs on the basis of a flawed constitutional theory that the 14th Amendment um, guaranteed the right of a child to negotiate with uh, his employer for a fair wage. And therefore, uh, it was unconstitutional to have a minimum wage law, to have um, health and safety laws. And then suddenly the Supreme Court switched not because the ideologues in, in the Supreme Court in those days suddenly um, saw the light, but because there was so much public pressure uh, that um, uh, they flipped their, their, their views. And that's the only way that this Supreme Court is going to change. Uh, obviously it would be better if uh, we had Supreme Court justices who were inclined to um, uh, view these things um, in the, uh, in light of the history that I've described and view uh, our segregation as a constitutional affront. But um, if there's a new civil rights movement, uh, uh, the Supreme Court will change its mind and will permit the kinds of policies that I described. That's at least uh, my view and expectation. I think we have time for one more question. 
Um, so we have a question that says, given the current uh, economy, similar to depression, is there an opportunity for federal, city, or state governments to, to do affirmative action type housing policies that you've mentioned? Uh, they sell similar to like reselling Levittown houses. Well, yes, there's, there's an opportunity, but the problem is political resistance on the part of, um, in particular, suburbanites who uh, um, will be opposed to what we call them NIMBYs, not in my backyard. In many cases, they're um, uh, so-called liberal Democrats who are liberal on all issues unless it affects their own communities. And uh, that's what needs to be overcome. So uh, sure, uh, state legislatures and, and local authorities can enact these policies if they had political support to, to do so, but they don't at this point. And that's our job is to make it uncomfortable for them not to implement these kinds of policies. At this point, uh, maintaining segregation is the popular thing to do, even though they don't say it by that name. Thank you so much. And I, we're almost at the end of our time together. So I just want to take a moment to thank everyone who came out. I especially want to thank you, Richard, for coming to do this talk with us. Um, I want to remind everyone the book is The Color of Law. Um, you can get it through the Tenement Museum or at your local independent bookstore. Um, and I really encourage you to read it. Um, it's really amazing. Richard, one of the things I really like about the book is that it has a frequently asked questions section in the back so that you can prep yourself for all those uncomfortable conversations and pushing back there. Um, and I really encourage all of you to read it. Um, if you would like to see the Tenement Museum and you live far away, we're doing virtual programming, which you can find on our website, um, so that you, like Richard, can experience the Tenement Museum. We also would really appreciate it if you'd like to leave a donation, and we'd really appreciate it if you bought the book. That would be really great. And if you read it and enjoyed it and had those conversations with people in your community and with yourself. Um, so thank you so much for tonight, Richard. Um, this was really wonderful and a wonderful opportunity. Um, and we will get you those email addresses that will get sent to our LESTM address at the Tenement Museum. Well, thank you. It was a privilege to be with you this evening. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful night.